It is my pleasure to introduce Brooke Deek. Um, Brooke is currently working as a research assistant here with me in the Social Dynamics and Environment Lab. Um, we've been dredging through mounds of Twitter data to investigate how coral bleaching on the GBR is being framed and diffused through social networks, social media networks. Um, Brooke has an academic background in geography and environmental science, um, but also has an extensive uh, you know, CV of project management experience. So she obtained her master's degree in environment from the University of Melbourne and has just submitted her PhD thesis at the University of Adelaide. So her research focuses on how social factors influence the implementation and effectiveness of environmental management strategies and campaigns. Um, and that certainly has a lot of relevance for the work that we do here at the center. And I believe that she'll be telling us a bit about, about that today. So let's all give her a warm welcome. And with that, I'll hand it off to Brooke. Thanks, Michelle. That was great. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, I know that this topic might be a little left field for some of you, and you're probably wondering what on earth uh, feral cats have to do with coral reef studies. Uh, this talk is based on the research that I did for my PhD thesis, uh, which I've recently submitted. And I'd like to, I'd like you to think of it more as a case study in the context of social research that can aid in environmental management. Um, my work involves looking at uh, perceptions and attitudes around feral cat management campaigns uh, on Kangaroo Island, South Australia, and in the Grampians region of Victoria. But I also did a lot of social media analysis on Twitter to see uh, differences in perceptions between countries such as Australia and the US and parts of Europe. Um, but the social research methods that I use can be widely applied to different fields in environmental science and it could even possibly be adopted by some of you in the future if you were interested. And I'm hoping that you'll learn a bit about feral cats and feral cat management along the way, but I also hope that you'll take away some of the information about what goes into gauging perceptions and attitudes um, and how to use sentiment uh, to look at different areas of environmental science, such as uh, coral reef studies. So in broad terms of invasive species management, uh, why concern ourselves with the general public's perceptions and attitudes uh, towards an invasive species and the methods used uh, to control them? Any effective invasive species management campaign really relies on public support and a social license to act, or in other words, the management goals that um, a business must adhere to uh, to meet the demands and expectations of society and not act in a way that is seen by society as being unacceptable. Uh, without social license uh, and support from the public, invasive species management campaigns can become delayed for weeks, months, uh, years, and sometimes indefinitely. For instance, in attempting to manage uh, rodents, uh, feral cats, and pig species on Wahiki Island and Pitt Island near New Zealand, uh, it was found that the residents of these islands accepted the eradication of the rodents and feral cats as a benefit to the island. But when it came to the feral pigs or wild pigs, uh, it was deemed undesirable because they were considered an asset in hunting. Uh, in another instance in managing the same pest species uh, on Lord Howe Island off the coast of uh, New South Wales, uh, the community seemed skeptical about the benefits of an eradication campaign and the ongoing deliberation has since delayed the program. And the eradication of stoats is kind of the same, same deal um, on Duraville Island, New Zealand. Uh, that program was also delayed for about 10 years because of insufficient community uh, acceptance. And it was only after extensive debate that social support for the program was generated. And therefore, it's, it's pretty important to engage with the community and figure out how they feel about the management taking place in their area um, in order to create a successful management campaign that, that meets social license. Now, my project uh, focused specifically on feral cat management. So I thought I'd go over a couple of feral cat facts so you can see why they're invasive and why we need to manage them in the first place. So cats are opportunistic feeders that require a high protein diet because they're unable to synthesize the essential vitamins and minerals that they need. Um, feral cats who have little to no interaction with people will hunt about several times a day. 
and one cat can decimate an entire population of small mammals and birds and reptiles, um, especially those that are highly concentrated in one area. Feral cats have been at least partially responsible for the extinction of 14% of native bird, mammal, and reptile species worldwide, including here in Australia, where about one third of all recent global extinctions have taken place. In 2001, feral cats were listed on the um, IUCN list of 100 worst invasive species and were considered the most damaging of the four carnivores on that species. They can also spread, link, uh, spread diseases to um, native felids in different countries, such as um, they'll spread like feline leukemia to uh, the endangered Iberian lynx in southeastern or southwestern Europe. Um, and besides their impacts on wildlife, cats also serve as a primary host for a number of diseases that pose a significant threat to wildlife, humans, and also livestock, such as toxoplasmosis, which can increase in, um, cause an increase in risk-taking behaviors in humans and is sometimes linked to mental disorders such as schizophrenia and attention deficit disorder. It is also known to produce a higher possib possibility of miscarriage or stillbirth. And in livestock such as sheep, the disease can cause abortion or weaken newborn lambs. Um, sarcoidosis is another disease that can be transferred from feral cats to sheep, and it can cause cysts to develop in the muscles of the sheep and cause the, the meat to be um, turned away from the abattoir, which can lead to significant uh, economic loss in places where, where sheep farming is a prominent industry. So in hearing all these facts about feral cats, uh, you would think it'd be obvious um, that the species should be managed and eradicated wherever possible. However, that's, that's not always the case. Uh, there is even contention here within Australia about managing feral cats, though the government has taken steps towards doing so. And there is a basic understanding of the need for management among the public. However, in certain places such as the US or parts of Europe, you know, feral cats are considered part of society and there are feral cat colonies um, where members of community will leave food and water and shelter out for these cats. And there's even a national feral cat day to raise, raise awareness about um, the plight of the feral cat. <laughs> Uh, and I wanted to look at the differences between, between the US and Europe and, and Australia and see really what's going on. Like wh why, are, why are these differences happening? And it's, um, from what I found, like there's no universal definition of what a feral cat is. Uh, and it depends on where you are in the world. And in Australia, the government has defined feral cats as the same species as domestic cats. Uh, with the difference being that these cats live um, out in the wild and reproduce and hunt and survive by hunting and scavenging, and they don't rely on humans for any resources. Um, in the US and parts of Europe, though, uh, these cats often live among stray and outdoor domestic cats. And the only way you can tell them apart really is by seeing the individual cat and seeing if it'll interact with people. And if it's fearful of people, then it's considered a feral cat. So it's not really that much defining a feral cat in, in US and parts of Europe. Um, even legislation around feral cats is quite vague in these countries. Uh, and the de definition can change based on a uh, county or suburb. And that's where the idea to uh, examine Twitter data came from. Uh, to see what people were actually saying about feral cats and how this related to where they lived um, and what groups or actors were really contributing to the conversation. So I decided to run a sentiment analysis, which is also known as uh, opinion mining, um, on tweets that mentioned feral cats. Uh, it uses machine learning to detect polarity in a text. Uh, whether it be like a novel chapter, a newspaper article, a social media post, or any other type of text. Um, it can detect feelings and emotions or even intentions. And depending on the amount of precision you want, you can use a sentiment analysis that provides either a binary score or a range score. And in some cases, 
uh, you can use a method that detects the emotions that are linked to that sentiment. Um, for this study, I ranged my sentiment analysis from a negative one to a positive one and uh, tailored it so that the, neg the positive sentiments in this regard would indicate whether a, a tweet was um, talking about caring about feral cats and wanting to save them or the opposite, uh, a negative sentiment was going to indicate uh, that feral cats were a pest species that needed to be managed. I was look interested in looking at data um, from the time when the feral cat cull was first announced in Australia, which was in July of 2015. Um, so I, I looked at data from, from January 2015 to December 2019, which is, was at the time the um, most recent um, time. And I collected approximately 500 tweets for each month over this five-year period and removed all the retweets. Um, for the purposes of the sentiment analysis. Otherwise, it may have skewed the data. Um, I re replaced usernames with categories depending on the nature of the user in order to distinguish different groups of users within the data set. Uh, these categories included like individual, science, government, animal welfare, uh, environmental organization, and a couple of others. Then, Using the sentiment R package in R, um, I ran the sentiment analysis on the data for each month over the five years, and then ran additional sentiment analysis for each country at the time and the groups within, within them. Uh, the average sentiment score over the course of the five years were mostly positive. Um, this is for the overall bit. Uh, with a slight decline in sentiment from January 2015 to December 2017, but there was a general increase in sentiment between January 2018 and December 2019, um, which I thought was interesting. But then after running a Chris School Wallace um, rank sum test, I uh, found that uh, the varied sentiments were contributed to by country and group and not really by date. So I took a look at the four countries which contributed to, to the highest number of tweets over the five-year period. And these included the US, Australia, Canada, and the UK. We found that the US, uh, Canada, and the UK had consistently positive scores over the five-year period with Australia being the only country uh, in the group that had consistently negative scores until about midway through 2019. And what we found when we looked at the makeup of the groups within each country was that individuals with no former affiliation to any other group, as well as animal welfare groups, made up the majority of people who were contributing to the conversation uh, around feral cats in the US, Canada, and the UK and that these groups frequently used words such as rescue, love, community, and also um, trap, neuter, release, which is a method that is commonly used in these countries where the feral cat is, is trapped in a cage trap and taken to the vet to be neutered or vaccinated, and then it's returned to the spot um, where it was found to be released again. Um, and it has a little ear tip as well just to just for people to know that it's been um, neutered and vaccinated so they don't take it back in. Um, this shows that in these countries, uh, the people discussing feral cats on Twitter uh, and pushing the conversation were those who were trying to, to care for the cats and ensure that they were saved. Whereas in Australia, it was a very different story of uh, the prominent groups talking about feral cats on Twitter at this time were government scientists, um, and individuals. And the words most frequently used to discuss cats in this regard were wildlife control, native impacts, tackling, and others that suggest that the uh, species is um, invasive and needs to be managed. An interesting difference, and one that highlights that the information being um, spread across to the Australian public about feral cats is coming from those who are at the forefront of creating and implementing these uh, feral cat management plans. 
And because scientists and government agencies are held to a higher standard when communicating information than like the average individual or um, most animal welfare groups, um, the information is most likely to be based on fact and, and logic and that it's not, the words used within wouldn't be as um, emotional. So they wouldn't use words that would uh, invoke emotion um, to, get, to get a response from people um, to feel sympathy towards the cats as they would in like the US or Europe. Um, and from this study, uh, we can get a sense of where the information on feral cats is coming from, at least on Twitter, and who's, who's contributing to the conversation and how they're doing it. Uh, this method could be used to look at sentiment around any topic on any environmental issue. Um, for instance, the work that I'm doing uh, with Dr. Barnes, uh, right now we're looking at sentiments around coral bleaching, and her study takes it a few steps further in looking at um, like the in-depth uh, flow of information and the actors that are involved in um, actually sharing this information. Um, but it shows that sentiment analysis is a broad method that can be used in multiple areas. And for the other half of my project, um, I focused on investigating attitudes and perceptions around various feral cat methods uh, from the general public and in parts of southeastern uh, Australia. So my study areas included Kangaroo Island, South Australia, and also the Grampians National Park region of Victoria. And these areas were chosen because they are highly regarded for their nature-based tourism and their prominent sheep farming industries, uh, both of which are under threat from feral cats. And because they, are, they were and still are at differing stages of feral cat management. So Kangaroo Island's feral cat eradication program was established in 2015, but community efforts to control the cats go back to like the 1990s. Uh, Victoria only more recently declared feral cats a pest species in 2018. And so management is in its earlier stages uh, for the state and for the Grampians National Park region. It was thought that the difference involved in the stages of feral cat management might provide useful insight into the levels of awareness that people had around feral cats and feral cat management between the two communities. And for this study, I chose to create an online questionnaire to gather information on people's ideas around uh, different feral cat management methods um, that might be used in or around their properties. Um, these include uh, baiting, where meat baits with poison are laid out for cats to digest. Um, there's two separate types of these. One is called eradicat, and that one um, involves the use of 1080, which is uh, highly controversial within Australia. Um, the other one is curiosity, which is why the, the talk was called um, Curiosity kills the cat. Um, and this one includes the use of a poison called PAP, which is uh, supposedly more centered on um, more centered on feral cats and less likely to um, affect other non-target species. Um, there's also trapping, uh, including padded leg hold traps and cage trapping, and then exclusion fencing, um, where cat-proof fences are installed. Uh, in areas to prevent cats from entering into certain areas um, where there's like endangered wildlife and things. And I worked with the Kangaroo Island NRM team and the Parks Victoria team and the Grampians to create a questionnaire. And it consisted of a couple of different sections, um, some of which asked participants to gauge their level of agreement with statements using a Liker type scale um, from one meaning strongly disagree to seven, which is strongly agree, uh, and others which were multiple choice or written response. Participants were also given short blurbs about each feral cat management method that was proposed for use so that they could uh, familiarize themselves a bit with it um, prior to answering certain questions. Then we sent the invitations out for the questionnaire to 
to participate in the questionnaire um, through the post to each address on Kangaroo Island and then each PO box in the Grampians National Park region of Victoria. And in the end, we ended up with about 213 questionnaires that could be used for analysis. Um, one of the main questions we were looking at in the survey was how likely people would be to allow the use of various feral cat management methods listed in the survey on their properties. And we had people gauge their likelihood of use um, for each method on that Liker type scale from one meaning highly unlikely to use and then seven being highly likely to allow the use of. We found that um, the factors that most influenced people in answering this question were gender, previous knowledge about the method, uh, land use and location. We found that while men were most likely to use all the methods listed, women were most likely to allow the use of methods that were non-lethal, such as cage trapping and exclusion fencing, and they were much less likely to allow the use of uh, lethal methods such as baiting with poison. Um, further, uh, previous knowledge of the method in in question was also influenced also influenced the likelihood of use uh, with people who are more familiar with the method being more likely to allow the use. However, um, women were especially hesitant to allow um, methods that they they weren't familiar with. Um, more so than men who were more willing to accept the use of of methods that they weren't familiar with and uh, familiarity was different depending on location as well. Um, Participants on Kangaroo Island were more likely to be familiar with various methods than those in the Grampians, where feral cat management um, is still in its early planning stages. Excuse me. We also found that uh, land use influenced the likelihood of using various methods on property. And that those with conservation land and those who were sheep farmers uh, we're more likely to allow the use of various methods than those in residential areas um, or those with other farming properties. We found that the sheep farmers were highly financially impacted by the presence of feral cats and that they were felt most strongly about the need to eradicate these cats because of that. At the same time, sheep farmers on Kangaroo Island were more familiar with management efforts and they were more confident in management's ability to uh, control feral cats than those um, sheep farmers in the Grampians region. Results from this particular study were useful to management authorities on Kangaroo Island and in the Grampians region because it allowed them to become a bit more familiar with the community's stance on feral cat management and what they might need to address in the future. Um, these kinds of studies are useful for environmental management and governance of all kinds, especially when you have opposing views on how to address important issues like invasive species or natural resource management um, or even climate change. I know quite a few studies have been done to address attitudes around climate change and climate uh, adaptation and how that might affect communities. And in terms of the Great Barrier Reef, I'd recently read a report from the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program that assessed stakeholder, traditional owner, and community engagement to ensure that the interventions proposed uh, for improving and restoring the reef were, were socially acceptable. So even though my research focused mainly on feral cat management, uh, I want you to know that these methods that I've talked about are very versatile and can be adapted and used in different environmental management contexts. Thank you. Thank you.